call this meeting of Raleigh Stormwater Management Advisory Commission to order. Um, welcome all the commission members, staff, and members of the public who may be uh, listening in. Especially want to welcome any members of the public who are here and value your attention um, to our proceedings here. Um, we did have a late uh, request from uh, Mr. Page for an excused absence from today's meeting. We have a motion to excuse. I'm going to excuse. Okay, Second. thank you. Second. All in favor? Okay, looks like that is unanimous. <clears throat> thank you, everybody. Um, we I trust everybody's had a chance to look over the minutes from our September meeting. Is there any uh, conversation, corrections, et cetera, about those minutes? Okay. Someone like to make a motion to approve the minutes from the September meeting? So moved. Mr. Carper. Uh, Mark will put you as a second. Second. Okay. All in favor? Okay. Any opposed? I saw a couple cameras off, so I'll just give you a chance to speak up. Otherwise, we'll take that as unanimous adoption of the minutes. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> we're a little early approaching our public comment period. Um, Wayne, do we have anybody signed up to give comments at this point? No, sir, I have not received any requests to make comments. I do not see anything in the in the chat, but I'll continue to monitor that in case we have a, a late breaking ad addition. Okay. Yeah, so if any members of the public are listening in and uh, feel a, a need to comment, um, Please enter something in the chat. Uh, just go ahead and put your comment in the chat and or request an opportunity. I, I think it's all by chat, right, Wayne? It, it, it is, although we do have the capability, um, should the commission choose to promote someone and allow them to make a statement briefly if they, if they would like to. We've done that once or twice for um, some project reviews, um, for example, rainwater reward. So we, we have the capability to do that. Okay. And let's see. We have also Wayne, um, I guess this would this be an appropriate time. It's not really officially on the agenda to mention uh, vacancies. On yes, the I think this would be appropriate. Mr. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, let's see, Glenn Taylor. Uh, has indicated that uh, he uh, is not going to uh, serve a subsequent term on the SMAC. Um, uh, Glenn, when does your term actually run out? I, I can uh, answer that um, yeah. if you'd like. Yes, it is officially yeah, this. Yes, it's officially this month. Okay. Um, and mis Mr. Taylor is welcome to continue attending meetings should he choose to do so until he's officially replaced by council. And the uh, the status of that is at the city council meeting, excuse me, this past Tuesday, they opened nominations for the vacancy, but um, no nominations were made at, at the meeting that, that night. So at this point in time, the vacancy is still open with no nominations. Okay, I'll continue until they find until somebody is nominated. Great, thank you. And Wayne, in terms of um, qualifications that you know our charter or our direction from the city council uh, requires, um, are there any particular qualifications that we're looking for or, or needing to fill in a vacant position? Good, good question. expertise or professional background or other other aspects 
Yes, good good question. And this came up at the council um, um, with the, the city clerk who started the nominations process too. Mr. Taylor was um, filling a spot for developers or those who work with the development community. So um, that that expertise would be lost. Now the way the qualifications is written in the ordinance um, is that um, engineers who do work on behalf of developers would also qualify for that position. So I believe we have at least two um, engineers who do work for developers. Um, uh, Mr. Carper, I believe, um, qualifies there. And um, um, who else? Mr. Senior, I, uh, would you say you would meet that qualification of working um, on behalf of the development community? Or, or no? Um, I would say yes. I'd okay. On behalf of the development community. Okay. Th thank you. So, so we we do have that um, representation still on the commission, then, Mr. Chair. So, um, our recommendation was that there was would not be a requirement to try to fill a specific qualifications, and that um, council should focus more specifically on the um, diversity um, related. Uh, qualify or qualify or criteria, I guess is a better word in terms of um, filling the, the vacancy. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think <clears throat> it would be uh, it would benefit Raleigh and the Stormwater Commission to um, move our commission to you know, making sure that we are representative of all the residents of Raleigh um, and the, the backgrounds that the diversity of Raleigh residents bring to the table. Uh, make sure that those backgrounds are represented here. Um, and in, in any opportunity that we have to do that uh, through a seat on the commission. Um, and I, I'm, I'm thinking of this, you know, in terms of not just Mr. Taylor uh, and his eventual rotating off of the commission, but uh, any one of us who may rotate off through term limits or personal choices. Uh, my own term, I think, expires in March of next year. Um, so I'm thinking about that in terms of myself as well. Um, any opportunities we have to uh, recruit talented individuals that bring us closer to representation of uh, the diversity of Raleigh would be welcomed. Um, <clears throat> Wayne, I guess at this point, uh, if, I mean, unless there's other conversations uh, we want to have on that, um, I'll turn it over. Well, first, I guess I'll turn it over to uh, Mr. Markwood. His observations, anything he wants to share at this point? Yes, sir. Thanks, Evan. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I just will give you a little bit of background about where I came from, what I'm doing here. Uh, I grew up in Roanoke, Virginia, did a lot of hiking and camping and always been in love with the outdoors. Also enjoyed building and, and math and science. And so when it came time being half an hour from Virginia Tech, it was sure that I would be applying to that engineering school and that would be that. Uh, but both my parents went to UVA. My bedroom was painted a, an obnoxious blue with orange trim and so there was a, a some mysterious force that pushed me a little further away from home uh, i came to raleigh in 1998 to have a look at nc state's campus and fell in love just spent five minutes on the campus and I knew I had to be here. So I was enrolled the next year. And I, I started down uh, structural and construction engineering pathway and did a co-op with Joe Construction. Then I'm so grateful I had a course with the late great Rooney Malcolm and uh, urban stormwater systems and it it changed my my life and he gave me wings and I was going to be a water resource engineer from there. So I started my career in 2005 
with Watershed Concepts, now AECOM. That was not long after the floodplain mapping program was developed. I've been studying modeling floods and loving GIS ever since. Uh, I spent a year in State College in 2010 with the AECOM office there, but otherwise I've been in Raleigh since 99 and now with the wife and son and daughter. Uh, I'm grateful to have joined the SMAC in 2018. It has been an amazing learning experience for me. There's no doubt about it. I feel quite guilty about what I've learned compared to my contributions. But one thing I've learned is that the city is in good hands with this stormwater staff and residents ought to be proud of the work being done. I sure am and uh, look forward to continuing to support that good work. Thank you, David. Sure. Appreciate your uh, contributions and uh, I can speak from my experience. Yeah, the learning curve uh, was long for me and I feel like I'm getting to the end of the uh, final term here and finally understanding how I can contribute. Um, next up, I think we have any comments on the Planning Commission SMAC liaison. Mr. Stansel, if you have anything to share. Mr. Chair, I don't have any comment for me at this time. Thank you. Any other upcoming issues with Planning Commission that we should be thinking about at this point, Wayne, from your perspective as staff? Uh, no, sir, I'm, I'm not aware of any. I attended the uh, City Council meeting this past Tuesday. Um, there were a couple comments about stormwater related impacts of some uh, proposed rezoning that would uh, will be sent to public hearing, but no, no major issues. I wasn't asked any specific questions about any of the, uh, the the conditions no no controversial projects related to stormwater specifically that have been brought up to, to my knowledge recently okay any other commissioner questions I did see Wayne that we had a um, comment in the chat uh, from an attendee asking how someone nominates a commission member. I believe that's by reaching out. Well, I'll let you speak to the official process if it's okay with you. Yep, yeah, yeah, be glad to, Mr. Chair. So there is an official nomination process and there's a nomination form on the city's website. Um, my suggestion would be go to the Raleigh NC Dot gov and go to the boards and commissions um, location and within that um, within that page there is a link to a, uh, a nomination form that can be filled out and is submitted to the city clerk um, and, and then you name the specific commission that uh, you are interested in as part of that nomination process um, and we'd we'd be glad if any I'd be glad to have anybody contact me if they are, have trouble finding that or would like more more information. And then those nominations are sent to City Council and are announced at the City Council meeting. And uh, the, the City Council then goes through the process of of uh, considering nominees and, and and voting and selecting of uh, the the final person that would fill the vacancy. Wayne, I can also post that for the attendees in the chat box. Oh, th thank you, Colin. Yes, that, that would be very helpful. That's great. Well, Wayne, I'll, I'll, uh, if there's not any other commissioner comments or questions, I'll let you get on with staff updates. Excellent, excellent. And, and, I, have, and I have quite a few um, that I'm very excited to announce some new Staff who we have in the in the stormwater division, please bear with me because we have we have several, um, but getting some uh, some some really good, um, very highly qualified and experienced staff members. Um, let, let me let me read through 
um, the, the most recent ones here. Um, Matt Hunt, who is hosting the meeting today, um, is our new um, budget management services uh, team leader. Uh, he brings experience in the public sector and beyond, came from Durham County's budget and management uh, services team, uh, where he assisted uh, county departments in the county management in developing, presenting the annual budget, but the budget development process includes, including gathering performance metrics um, and making recommendations for, for the budget. His experience also includes coordination with enterprise funds, um, sewer, utility, and stormwater. And he has a, a master's degree in public administration from NC State University, as well as an undergraduate degree in mechanical engineering. So um, a great, great addition to our team. Welcome, welcome, Matt. Glad to have you here. Um, Thank you. Thank you all. The, uh, the next person I'd like to announce, uh, Stephen Geltima has filled the stormwater engineer position with the water quality section. Stephen comes to us from the private sector, brings with him over 13 years of stormwater experience, um, from ranging from um, illicit de uh, detection um, programs and municipal separate stormwater sewer, MS4 um, systems for the uh, US Navy support facilities, as well as TMDL compliance um, for municipalities across the country, uh, as well as site monitoring for a, a range of type different parameters. He'll be managing our illicit um, discharge detection elimination program, um, a good housekeeping, pollution prevention program, industrial inspection program, and assisting with uh, other projects and initiatives within the water quality section. So we're very happy to have Stephen um, here with us as well. Uh, next. We have uh, Zachary Poole uh, has filled a position in stormwater engineering specialist, also within water quality. Be, he'll be working closely with, with Stephen. Um, Zachary is a NC State graduate, brings several years of experience field and site work, including site remediation, data collection, and uh, technical report preparation and, and, and delivery. He'll be our primary contact for our illicit discharge detection elimination program. And uh, we'll also be assisting with the PBGH, Pollution Prevention, Good Housekeeping, and Industrial Inspection Programs, uh, along, along with, with, with Stephen. And uh, both Stephen and Zachary uh, will be working closely with Justin Harkham. Um, as you know, recall, Justin got promoted recently to lead that group. And so um, Justin's been filling three roles. And so I know Justin's very happy to have um, Stephen and, and, and Zachary on board to help him as, as well. A few more, if uh, you would please bear with me. Um, Claudia White has recently stormed our, uh, joined our stormwater team this week, actually is a mass asset management engineer. Uh, Claudia is from Warren, Warrington, North Carolina, is and a recent graduate from the Biological and Agricultural Engineering Department at NC State. And she'll be working with the asset management team to develop our rehabilitation program and also assist with um, maintenance design work, working very closely with our transportation field services uh, group. We have uh, two new project managers um, who are um, have both been with the city of Raleigh and so bring very good experience. We're excited to have um, Amy Billings um, come to us as she had previously been a project manager with Roadway Design and Construction Group and she'll um, be moving into stormwater to manage our CIP and drainage assistance projects. Um, she brings quite a bit of stormwater experience and stream restoration experience um, that she had both with roadway design. She was one of our biggest advocates of green stormwater infrastructure in that group, um, as well as um, the 18 years of experience she had with NCDOT um, in the hydraulics unit, um, including Rosgen level stream restoration assessment. And um, she also leads the uh, citywide growth and natural resources strategic plan for green stormwater infrastructure. So she had already um, had that role prior to coming to stormwater. So an excellent fit for our team. Um, and we're glad to have Amy joining us as well. Um, and then uh, Reed Huntley. Um, Reed um, will be a, also a new project manager in the CIP group. Now, Reed had been with us for uh, the past two years as a field inspector in the CIP group overseeing our construction work. So he could, um, uh, brings a good construction perspective. He has the professional engineer 
He is a professional engineer um, with about 10 years of experience, uh, also a graduate of NC State, having studied under Dr. Bill Hunt in the bio and ag department. And he, he has a lot of stormwater modeling drafting background um, and will also um, be available to help with in-house in design projects as well as managing consultants on our CIP delivery team. And uh, last but not least, um, Emily Clark, has joined our water quality team as an intern. Uh, she's providing temporary part-time help to assist with stream mo monitoring and data collection. Um, and uh, she um, comes uh, to us from NC State with a BS in biological engineering and environmental sciences as well. So lots of great additions to our team. We're very excited about our growing team. And, and there's uh, at least two others that we have acceptances for for other roles, but can't quite announce them yet. So we'll do that at the next at next month's meeting. Thanks for that update, Wayne. And uh, I, I missed a couple of uh, names there, but I'll just welcome all those new team members. This is a an ex, uh, an excellent program to be joining, and an exciting time to be uh, joining it. Thank you, and thank you for the support of, of the commission um, in increasing our level of service, um, especially the uh, the asset management uh, team roles that we're, we're we're adding have been additions and expansions to the to the program based on level of service recommendations the commission has made. So we we very much appreciate the that support. Um, if I may move move on, um, uh, a, a couple quick. Uh, just updates to, to keep you in the loop with more information um, uh, coming. Um, we are working on a model ordinance update to um, meet the um, uh, to match our UDO requirements to the state's model ordinance. Uh, ben Brown is leading that effort. Um, ben, I, would you mind maybe a, a couple quick sentences on the the, the charge and um, our objectives of that that model ordinance update? Um, sure. Although um, it's a good thing that we're virtual because Lauren would probably hit me with something if I took credit for for uh, the work that she did. <laughs> Lauren, um, Lauren uh, with us been on my staff, did most of the coordination work to kind of get this together to see what this uh, text change could possibly look like to kind of adopt a model um, ordinance that the state published last spring uh, for the new nutrient sensitive waters. Uh, there won't be too many um, changes or anything like that. There'll be like three or four things that'll be uh, definite changes the way we kind of do business as far as how projects are, are just reviewed and how like the loading rate for uh, the, the uh, nutrients that was calculated. So, so, I mean, there will be some issues that, that we'll have to get through with our um, uh, applicants on that. But um, once we hear back from the state to see if they've accepted kind of what our draft uh, ordinance would look like to uh, um, conform with the model ordinance, we'll be bringing a presentation back to this group to kind of go over those changes and kind of exactly what they are. But we want to make sure that uh, um, the, the uh, state is in agreement that it's in compliance with the model ordinance before we bring it back to you all. Great, thank you, Ben. Appreciate it. Um, the next update, um, our quarterly Raleigh Rainwater Rewards report memo was included in your in your package. Um, Justin Harkum is is here. J Justin, so um, be glad to take any questions now on that report or um, later on. Justin is um, on the agenda to present several. Raleigh Rainwater Rewards project. So be glad to answer any questions on the quarterly report then as, as well as would be preferred by the, the commission. And then lastly on that item, um, on hot topics, um, we have no uh, specific notices for um, construction uh, to, to announce at this time. And that's all we have, Mr. Chair. Be glad to take any questions. I'll invite any commission members with questions to go ahead and raise them now.
Okay. Um, any particular, I mean, the, the quarterly report for Raleigh Rainwater Rewards was uh, pretty straightforward. I don't know if there's anything in particular that uh, Justin would like to point out to us. Okay, or if any commission members had any questions. Looks like we have none. Okay, so we can move on, I guess, to our drainage assistance project reviews. Chas, I think you're muted. <clears throat> Still not hearing you. Tyler, are you aware of any audio issues with, with Chaz? Can you all hear me now? Yes. Y yes, we can hear you now, Chaz. <clears throat> yeah, sorry about that. I'm trying to trying to work through this. And you all can uh y'all can see my screen here just fine. Can you see my screen? Not, not sharing at this time. It it was it, up. It went away when you came back in your audio. Just transferred it back to him. Now we can see the screen, Chaz. You all can see the screen now? And we can hear you too. Good. Excellent. All right. There we go. All right. Good afternoon, commission members. It's uh, great to be talking with you again. Hopefully we can do this in person soon. Um, let's just go through a presentation overview. We'll, we'll look at the pending projects, then the project map locations, followed by the project requests, and look at the funding overview, and then we'll open it up for uh, recommendations and questions. So here we have the, the pending uh, projects. We're up to 98 on the project list. Uh, the first two that we're going to look at, or the only two, excuse me, that we're going to look at today are Holden Street and Onslow Road. Uh, so here's a map showing the locations. Um, Y'all can see the, the two locations here. We have uh, Holden Street just a little bit east of downtown and Onslow near the western end of uh, the 440. Interstate. So let's start with uh, 706 and 712 Holden. We have a pipe running underneath 706 Holden. Uh, the pipe, as you'll see in a few slides, is in bad condition. So what we would do is we would uh, reroute the pipe east down the right of way and then reroute it south as close to the property line of 706 and 712 Holden. Uh, the pipe is 24 inch of ECP um, running underneath the house. Um, and as I said, it's, it's, an, uh, it's in deteriorating condition. Um, so the picture on the left is looking uh, east down in front of 706 Holden. Uh, this is an inlet in the right of way. Um, as you can see, there's, there's not a lot of room uh, this is an older neighborhood, so as you can imagine, things were built relatively close together. Uh, but as you cross 706 Holden and get into the picture on the right on 712 Holden, you can see it opens up with a vacant lot, and that we would uh, we would run it down again, as I said, as close to, to 712 and 706 
Holden. Uh, here's a picture shown on the CCTV. You can see there are some off offsets in the pipe. Again, like I said, it's it's not in the best condition. Uh, there is some street flooding, but the drainage basin to that pipes isn't all that large for a 24 inch pipe. Uh, so we don't believe that the pipes are undersized. Uh, we think the head loss is coming from the pipe condition uh, underneath the house with some of the offsets. Um, th but I also wanna point out that this project is scoring uh, very high with a safety crit critical score of 90, so we are estimating the cost to be $190,000. Uh, Any questions about Holden Street? What's driving that safety criticality score? Is it just the fact that it runs under a house? It's underneath a house, yes, sir, and it's um, it's deteriorating pipe, as you can see in the CCTV. The C there are other pictures in the CCTV, and it shows that it's just the pipe's not in good condition. Um, if no other questions about Holden, what we'll do is we'll move on to Onslow. Uh, here's an aerial view. There is a driveway that crosses the creek. Um, the driveway is the only means of access to the home. And within that uh, driveway, there is a hole. The hole is about five foot deep and two feet by two feet wide. Um, the pipe material is CMP and that pipe is also failing. Uh, the, the pipe is also undersized. Uh, the drainage basin to the pipe is about 40 acres. Excuse me, and that's flowing through a 24 inch pipe. Get some more pictures here. Um, here you can see the, the pipe uh, failing and then the, the undersized pipe on the right. Um, so what we would do is we would uh, install a 42 inch pipe. We believe that would be sufficient to get the flow through also because uh, downstream there's also a 42 inch pipe. Um, and that seems to be conveying the flows uh, just well. And then this is looking towards the bridge uh, from the creek, just to give you a little bit uh, zoomed out look. Uh, we are estimating the cost to be $149,000. Any questions about Onslow Road? Commissioners. All right. Uh, so when you combine uh, 706, 712 Holden with uh, 1307 Onslow, you take take the 190,000, add 149,000, and you get uh, $339,000 uh, for this period. And then uh, that would leave us with uh, one one hundred one million uh, twenty five thousand dollars. So that concludes the report. Um, welcome. Uh, any questions uh, or recommendations or comments? I'll invite any commission members with questions or comments to please speak up and uh, ask away. Thank you, Chas. Sounds like we don't have anything for you. Um, appreciate you presenting that information to us. Um, do we have a motion to approve either or both of these projects? Motion to approve. Thank you, Ken. And is that that's for both? Yes, for, for both projects. Okay. We have a second. Second. Thank you, Mark. 
Any comments or questions on the motion? Okay. All in favor of approval? Looks like that is unanimous. Thank you, Chess. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay, Justin. <clears throat> Looks like you're yes, up. Good for... afternoon, everyone. Can you can you hear me all right? Just fine, thanks. Excited to present to y'all today. I have uh, four applications for the Raleigh Rainwater Rewards Program. They all four have uh, been in the works preparing their applications since spring. So we have several folks in attendance that are connected to these projects and Matt, you can, uh, if you're able to go ahead and pull up my slideshow, please. Yes, um, Colin, can you please give me uh, the host access? Should be good now. Awesome. Thank you. You see my screen? of which are rain garden applications. One is a permanent permanent paver project, and then there is a uh, fourth project is a combination of a rain garden and permanent paver project on the same property. So I also want to note um, out the gates that uh, none of these projects have triggered uh, the program nitrogen program cap, the nitrogen metric cap that was uh, recommended by the commission this last February. To state that, and I'll, I'll demonstrate that in more detail as we go along. Matt, do you want to start show the slideshow? All right. Uh, first project is 309 West Drury Lane, um, Crabtree Creek, eligible for 75% reimbursement. It's a very large rain garden. Uh, this uh, uh, applicant reached out uh, back in March. And have has worked out uh, worked through their application um, received several estimates. Um, as you can see, it's a lot of impervious surface. They're going to treat their entire house and their driveway runoff. Next slide, please. And uh, you'll you can see here uh, they have a good positive drainage to the back of the property where they're able to make 1 large feature. It's large enough to capture all of uh, the impervious. Pretty much on their property. Uh, I have met with other property owners on the other side of this fence and adjacent here where they're also interested in the program. Uh, there is a little bit of a um, nuisance flooding uh, concern here, and they are, the, owner, the applicant is hopeful that this will help mitigate that uh, in some degree. Uh, there is a pretty poor infiltration rate at this site, so the uh, design does include an underdrain. Uh, however, the slope does work to their advantage there where the underdrain will have will be able to daylight uh, with the slope. Please, uh, next slide. And uh, you'll see the estimated project cost. This applicant uh, has already received uh, 3 estimates per the policy requirement. Uh, the lowing, lowest being the basis of this application. Pretty straightforward with the uh, expect, expected expenditures for this project, with the exception of the underdrain, which is, uh, I wouldn't say unique, but uh, um, unique to this project. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Uh, here are the water quality metrics here. And as stated before, the um, note the cost of pound of nitrogen removed over the life of the project is right around 2000. Where the program cap is is seven thousand, well underneath the cap. It's a big rain garden capturing a lot of impervious surface runoff. Next slide, please. Uh, here's uh, a slide you will see two more times. It, it shows the three rain gardens we will be reviewing today. Uh, they are all right in line, or comparable to each other. 
You'll see this again as we get through the other projects. Next slide, please. A regular maintenance for a rain garden, 10 year maintenance period. The applicant is aware of the maintenance responsibility. And, uh, nothing out of the ordinary on this either. Next slide, please. And, uh, I'm more than happy to move forward through all four applications, or we can approach these, or I can take questions on each individual project. Any commissioner members want to raise questions about this project right now? Five two seven. Oh, sorry. No, that's all right. I was just going to tell you to go ahead. Thank you. Move on to five two seven Pal Drive. It's in the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, it's in the Bushy Branch watershed. Seventy five percent eligibility. This is a pulmonary paver project. Uh, the initial consult on this property was in April. Uh, they are capturing not only the footprint of their gravel drive, which is uh, in the, on the uh, next slide, please. Uh, this gravel drive on the right, but they're also directing the maximum 1500 square foot and additional impervious surface runoff off their roof. So they're, they're maximizing the 1 to 1 ratio that uh, has been um, provided as a maximum by NCDEQ design standard. So a total of 3000 square feet are, are, are being treated here. Or proposed to be treated. Next slide, please. Um, so you'll see the uh, the cost here. They have received uh, three estimates as well uh, prior to submitting their application, and this the, the low cost being the basis for this cost uh, or for this application. Um, and as uh, the commission and the commission members may recall, the rainwater reward policy was revised in 2015, and that changed how permal paver projects were supported by the program. Uh, it is not a direct 75% reimbursement, but it is instead a, uh, a reimbursement of the difference in cost between a traditional driveway install and a permanent paver driveway install in the same footprint. So that explained in numbers here, you'll see a total cost estimate, uh, 22,850. You subtract the estimated cost of a traditional driveway being installed there, $7,500, gives you what we call the acceptable cost, 15,350. The applicant would then be eligible for 75% of that difference. So that $15,350, hence the breakdown there. Um, you, if there's any questions, please let me know. You will see this uh, very similar breakdown in, in our fourth project as well. No questions, we can move to, I'm sorry. Just, Justin, I did have a quick question. The, um, the cost of conventional driveway, uh, how often is that updated or how do we get up to date estimates on that. Uh, good question, Evan. Um, we have historically used five dollars per square foot, and uh, if uh, it has not yet been challenged, on, I guess e either side of of the fence there. So um, that's it's it's been a historical basis, at least through the years I've been involved. Do you know how recently that was updated? I, I do not. It might have been the only number used. Um, we do not have a lot of comparables for thermal paver projects. I think we've supported 10 in the history of the program. And this change occurred in 2015. So any project since 2015. So, um, I'm, I'm guessing probably sometime 16, 17, it was the first time it was used, but it's been, been around five years. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for Justin on this one? Slide, please. Can, can y'all hear me? Yeah. Yep. Once again, you'll see the 
um, with to see the cost per pound of nitrogen removed over the life of the project with it being 10 years, uh, 10 year maintenance period is a very attractive nitrogen removal uh, um, ratio. And uh, keep in mind the cap program cap is $7,000 per pound a year removed over life. Next slide, please. Here is uh, the comparison against all previously approved formal paver projects. Uh, and Evan, I've got to go back to your question. If you notice the, uh, the projects on this list that have the asterisks next to them, the double asterisks, they were all approved prior to that change. And so the $5 per square foot would have slight conjecture here, but would I would argue it was for the all the remaining projects other than those three, which date back um, to 2016. All right, okay. no questions. Next. Um, next slide, please. Maintenance requirements. Uh, what's typical of thermal paver systems? Uh, we are looking at a 10 year maintenance period. Next slide, please. And that is all I have on 527 PAL drive. All right. Uh, Justin, uh, just I pause to give anybody else a chance to ask a question. Is maybe you mentioned this already. Is the, the downspout drainage being directed onto that permeable pavement? Is that the idea there? Yes, sir. Uh, the there are downspouts. If you're looking down the driveway to the left coming off the house, both the front and the back downspouts on that side are being directed to to the surface of that um, that permanent paver system. And they actually had more than they would, were able. We limited it to 1500 square feet because we didn't want to exceed the state's guidance to the one to one ratio. That's the, the one to one ratio is of additional square footage to be drained onto the permeable pavement surface itself. Right. So, a, a thousand, so in this case, 1500 square foot permeable paver system uh, per NDC of the state's guidance uh, can't have more than 1500 square feet of additional impervious surface. And then recommended zero pervious runoff. And that's been considered as well. Thank you. Happy to move into our, my third project for today. It's a 112 Payne Court. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, it's in the Big Branch uh, watershed. Once again, eligible for 75% reimbursement. It's another large rain garden. A really interesting cul-de-sac here. Uh, the neighbor to the, uh, I guess, slightly to the northeast I uh, just completed a project or, or had a project approved through uh, the program at the staff level. So they have a smaller rain garden. Uh, this property next door, the one I'm presenting on today, um, they met, I met with both folks back in, in the spring, back in March. And you're looking at a lot of impervious surface uh, that includes a large house footprint and a, and a very large driveway that flows down all going through their backyard. Uh, and they have a, uh, a good footprint to, to to be able to install a system of of, of this size. And so it, it's uh, it was they they wanted to move forward with the rain garden uh, back as it showed on the next slide. Next slide, please. And you'll see that large driveway and the uh, large footprint in the backyard. Um, plan is the is the capture their all their downspouts and have a drain to capture the the runoff off their driveway. Um, no under drain will be needed for this system due to the uh, good infiltration here. All right, uh, next slide, please. They have also this, the applicant has also went ahead and obtained 3 cost estimates. Uh, they range from 13,000 all the way up to 18,000 for this feature. You see the, um, the cost breakdown here. The 13,000. Cost estimate is the basis for reimbursement. Uh, the, the total is 14,000 because you add the design cost in with that. Next slide, please. 
You can see the water quality metrics here. Once again, very comparable to the uh, the first project I presented on, and it is uh, I believe it is the same uh, contractor who uh, had the lowest estimate for both of these projects, both the first one I presented on and this one. Next slide, please. You'll recognize this slide uh, as the back of the Drury Lane presentation. Shows how it compares. Uh, also, a note I failed to make uh, on the first time this slide came up is this is a uh, uh, trundic was it truncated or abbreviated or I had this. We're getting up to 74, 75 rain gardens, and the to fit them on a single slide is it has become a challenge. So I, I've kind of lopped off the middle top and the middle bottom to try to give a good representation of where these land. All right, next slide, please. Ten year maintenance period, same as the last two projects, owners are well aware, and the legal agreement will uh, protect the city's interests in that regard. And next. Next slide, please. That's all I have for 1112 Payne Court. Thanks, Justin. Any commissioners with questions on that one? Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, the final project I have for you today, next slide, is uh, 2353 Loudon Street. Once again, uh, first consult or contact was made back in March. This is a challenging site and project. Uh, uh, it's it's they want to capture a majority of the runoff on their property, impervious surface runoff on their property. Uh, it, they want to have a rain garden to capture the front part of the the house, and then permal paver driveway to replace their existing driveway, and then capture portions of a patio that uh, is as on the property. Um, so they're, they're, the systems are not necessarily connected, so there's not double treatment here. So they are treating separate uh, impervious drainage areas. Once again, it's very tight footprint, as you'll see in the upcoming photos. Next slide. Lots of uh, impervious surface and tight footprint. So you will see um, the the blue highlighted areas is what will be draining to the uh, to the uh, rain garden, and you'll see the rain garden up the future location up in the front corner of the lot, outside of the right of way, uh, in the front yard. Uh, next slide, please. And you'll see the additional impervious that will be routed down to this driveway footprint. Once again, uh, not including the right of way. And a little bit of their porch and a little side shed unit there. Some of that runoff will also be directed to it. Once again, maximizing that 1 to 1, but also not not able to capture it all because of that limitation. All right, next slide, please. So you'll see um, th I've broken out the cost for this by project type. So this is for the rain garden portion of the project. Uh, pretty detailed, uh, itemized estimate, right in range from what typically would be a staff level approval. This is very comparable to what we see a lot at the staff level of the program. Uh, next slide, please. Permal paver estimate. Uh, you'll see uh, once again that same same breakdown or reduction in, to to get to the acceptable cost. So minus the footprint times five dollars per square foot gets you a new acceptable cost of twelve thousand two hundred dollars. And to tie it all together. Next slide, please. You'll have the two project total costs. Rain garden 4,389 plus the new acceptable cost for the permanent pavers uh, with a total project cost for the entire site of 16,589. Uh, there would be their maximum eligibility would be 75% of that combined total, which is shown right here. And next slide, please. Uh, what I've done on this next slide is I've also combined the total. Uh, Water quality or the, the water quality metrics for the entire site, not individually. So you'll see um, the, the total both projects combined site. Once again, about half of our program cap. If you look at it through the lens of the metric, 
Next slide, please. This also is a 10 year maintenance period. Or, sorry, I jumped ahead. Uh, you see this slide again with how it compares. It's very much the rain garden is very much in line with the other rain gardens presented here today. From a um, remind you, these are ranked by the nitrogen removal metric number. So the cost per pound of nitrogen removed. You'll see how cost effective these are at, at removing pollutants from stormwater runoff. These are all um, very close in how cost effective they are from that standpoint. <laughs> Next slide. And a similar comparison for permanent pavers. All right, next slide, please. And the, the maintenance requirements are no different than the, the two that were shown on the previous slides. Uh, nothing changes for, 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 these, for these two systems. And once again, the legal agreement will, will be the binding document for, that, uh, for the duration of the maintenance period. Next slide. Next slide. And that is all I have on 2353 Loudon Street. Happy to take any questions. Thanks, Justin. Does any commission member have a question or comment about any of these projects? Well, sounds um, sounds like these might be uh, ripe for bundling together into one motion if someone is inclined to do that. We should approve all the projects. Second. All right. I had a motion from Mr. Senior, second by Mr. Carper. Any discussion on the motion to approve these projects? All right. Um, all in favor, if you could have your cameras on and just raise your hand. And Glenn, if you have a chance to say yes or no, any opposition to the motion? Okay. Looks like that is unanimous. Thank you, Justin. Did I miss anybody there? Okay, so that covers our uh, action items. Next on the agenda, we're, we're rolling way ahead of schedule, um, is the flood or an update on the flood early warning system implementation. Thank you, Evan. This is Kelly Daniel. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. All right, great. We'll do an audio check. Uh, let me see if I can share my screen here for you. I don't know if you can see that presentation. Yep, looks good. Okay. Um, I don't know what to do, Evan. I'm currently on, on unusual ground. Most of the time I'm doing the presentation and I'm supposed to have 20, 30 minutes and I've got five. So. Now I've got an hour out there. So. <laughs> we'll try to think of something. <laughs> we'll make up. We have, have to use it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So what I'm going to uh, like to do for y'all today is give you a presentation um, on some updates for our flood early warning system. And I would also like to take the opportunity, since it looks like we uh, do have potentially have some extra time uh, allowed to actually go into the software and let you see it and, and see what we see. I uh, think you, I think you'll probably enjoy that. I know I do. So, uh, but I may be biased, but uh, I'm going to do a little bit of a, a recap. Uh, I think we did the last presentation on the flood early warning system, maybe in October of last year. So it's been about a year and um, some of these slides may be a look a little similar. Uh, I want to do that because I know we may have some new uh, SMAC members. And it's kind of get them up to speed on the program as well as going to some new stuff. Um, so we'll, things we'll cover today is uh, what we have in our flood early warning system program, such as uh, cameras will review flooding. 
uh, the automated signs and the automated valve controls. Also, we'll take a look at the stream and rainfall gauge system uh, that we have and, and updating, and also the new uh, flood only warning system technology, such as the software. So, as a recap from last year, we do have our, uh, our what we call our traffic slash flood cameras. Uh, we partner with uh, transportation, uh, the city's transportation department with these cameras. Uh, we purchase and they install and they use them on the normal day to day uh, when it's not raining, so to speak, uh, to monitor traffic. And we use these cameras plus the ones that they purchased during storm events uh, to monitor flooding. So it's turned out to be a really great uh, cooperation between these two, uh, coordination between the two groups. And uh, we're, we're both enjoying it and look to uh, can keep building out this uh, camera network uh, to be able to help us view things in real time. Also, we have some flood warning signs around the city. I know some of you may have been driving during rainstorms, may have seen them actually flashing. If not, maybe just seen, seen them out there in certain locations. So we got uh, eight locations where we have a sensor and signs and the sensor being there's a pole sensor uh, in the low spot of the road. So when the water gets up to that level, it, uh, uh, get the take, get an indication that there's water there and then send a signal to the, the signs to start flashing saying there's high water. Um, so there's eight locations where we have those. We do have two locations that we have sensor only. And those would be um, one of them's at uh, Raleigh Union Station. There's a low area there where traffic goes through uh, during uh, heavier rainfall events so that area can flood. And it sends uh, a notification to the, to the uh, people there, uh, property manager there at the Union Station and, and they can go out there and shut that area down if they need to. And there's also one out at uh, one of the parks in uh, Southeast Raleigh that had some, some flooding problems. Uh, these are automated flood warnings. There's push notifications that sent out to folks when that sensor is triggered. Uh, and they can get text or email and or or it can even come by phone, like a phone call, and leave a message if need be. Uh, and we're looking at potential opportunities to install some more uh, around around Raleigh. As I said, this is just a, a pilot project right now, uh, seeing how, how it works. Uh, another thing that we have uh, in the business the planning and business section is uh, under the SEMs and DAM section is the automated valve controls on risers. So we got a pilot project out at Lake Johnson, and we can remotely uh, control the valve there at Lake Johnson and open it up uh, to to lower it for preparation for uh, storm events. Uh, the last time we did this was Tropical Storm Elsa, uh, where we lowered it. I believe it was a foot and a half uh, prior to the event, and uh, shut off the valve about 12 hours prior to the event starting. And that's roughly the, the time frame it takes for the water that's released in Lake Johnson to actually go through the city uh, where we monitor and let the, the higher levels after we're releasing it, the levels come back down in the creek uh, before the storm event starts. So that's that's key to know that. Um, and these are cell, cell phone. You can control it from cell phone or go to the website and do it. It can also be hooked up to NOAA weather alert to be automatically activated. And there is a, a siren and flashing lights for safety when the valve is open um, and releasing because the additional water that comes out the gate down there. It can be hooked up to solar, it's solar capable as well. And there's a, a water level sensor out there that levels that monitors and we can keep a check on the water as it's, as it's dropping and make sure we're keeping at a consistent rate because uh, the state doesn't want us lowering it any more than I believe it is a foot uh, a day. So in 24 hours, so we want to make sure we stay within that that threshold. Um, we are also potentially looking at adding uh, this to some more of the city uh, facilities across Raleigh. That's that's hopefully something uh, to come in in the next year or two. But like I said, this is a, a pilot project and seems to be working uh, really well right now. All right, let's take a, a quick look at our stream and rainfall gauge system. Um, many of you have probably seen these riding around town, uh, around the creeks. You might see a, a sticker that says USGS on the sign, the side of a box. So we partner with USGS on the stream and rainfall gauges. Around. And we've had a, we've, Mark may continue how far we've been going back. I, I don't know if I can, but, um, but we have, we used to renew the contract or agreement every year. 
uh, we kind of got smart, I believe, and, and decided to go with five year renewal so we wouldn't have to do it every year. I mean, we do have the ability to go back and amend uh, the agreement as needed uh, anytime during the five year agreements, but we typically uh, go for about five years. And USGS, uh, they install the gauges and maintain them, and they do an outstanding job. We've got a great relationship with them right now in partnership. Uh, outstanding folks, if we see an issue, they're usually out there the next day, uh, if that not that, if not that day, taking a look at it and uh, getting it back up online or whatever the issue may be. Uh, but the city, uh, we fund, do the ongoing funding of the maintenance and costs. So USGS installs them, maintains them, and we fund uh, the installation and maintenance. Um, but, let's see, but one good thing, as as we get opportunities uh, through through these years, we can we can add some stuff, right? We don't have to continue on with the same thing every year. Uh, we're excited about this this year. We have actually added uh, four new rain gauge locations um, in, this year, and they are at fire stations. We talk. We've we partnered with transportation on uh, the camera the cameras and the camera network. Uh, now we're also have spoke with the fire department and they're excited as well as we're excited about the future of potentially putting uh, quite a few uh, rain gauges at fire stations. Uh, we kind of took a look at where we may needed some additional uh, rain gauges and looking at fire stations there. If you think about it, they're kindly uh, spaced out somewhat equally throughout Raleigh and which is great for, for the rain gauge network. And we talked with the fire department. They got on board with it. We installed these uh, four. Uh, they're enjoying it and told us and gave us the permission to obviously in, in coordinate with them to be able to install uh, rain gauges at any one of the fire stations we would like to. So, so that that's awesome. So the, the new ones we got uh, this year is one at Pinecrest Road. They're off of uh, Leesville, close to Leesville Road, and Morgan's Way off of Creekmore and uh, Spring Forest Road. Uh, there in Northeast Raleigh, and then one at Barwell Road. I'm gonna back up a slide, and you'll and you'll see uh, the uh, original, what I call the original or older gauges. And you can see they're concentrated around the belt line, right inside the belt, the 440 belt line, along um, Creedmoor Road, and also not Creedmoor Road, but Cre Lake uh, Lake Crabtree and Walnut Creek. But if you go to the the new ones, you'll see, we kind of put them between the 440 belt line and the 540 belt line. So we didn't have any rain gauges uh, in that location. And rain gauges are a very important uh, part of our flood early warning system, especially the software and getting data and up-to-date information into the software to make predictions about flooding uh, that potentially may be going on in Raleigh. So uh, we picked these, these areas uh, for four uh, this year, and we will be hopefully be adding some additional uh, gauges in the next year or two. It'd, it'd be great to do that with council's approval. Also, something new we're working on uh, with that uh, updated agreement is the Alert 2 system. So, currently, uh, or in the past, I would say, the, uh, the gauges reported through the GOES network or GOES satellite network. And uh, they would report every 15 minutes or every hour. Uh, the Alert 2 system is a radio reporting system and has the capability of giving us five minute data. And when you're talking about um, a software, a flood early warning system software, where it's making predictions on uh, potential flooding, it has the capability of doing and does do five minute updates. And if we were still sending information that was 15 minutes old or an hour old, it keeps doing the same, so to speak, same prediction over and over again every five minutes. And now with the, um, the Alert 2 system, it has the ability to recalculate and do new predictions every five minutes. It's giving us new predictions on what the flood potentials are uh, throughout Raleigh. Now, uh, currently, uh, the gauges that we have on the west side of Raleigh have all been updated to the Alert 2 system. Uh, the east side of Raleigh gauges, uh, they need a repeater tower, what's called a repeater tower, 
to get the signal and send it over to the USGS office, which is on the west side of Raleigh. And we are working with uh, one of the building owners uh, downtown for a contract to install a repeater tower there. And we have uh, done a test, some tests on there. And from the from that building, we can receive a signal from all across Raleigh. So that, that gives us an opportunity uh, to install uh, a gauge and put the, uh, the radio on the alert 2 system on that gauge anywhere in Raleigh. And we'll be able to receive receive that signal. So we're really looking forward to getting that contract uh, done and getting that repeater antenna installed and getting all the east east side of Raleigh uh, updated with alert too. So let's let's talk about the the flood early warning system. We get down all these all these things come in to kind of to kind of into this and our new technology and software. So what does the flood early warning system? Do. It's a it's a predictive model based warning system that has uh, gauge adjusted radar rainfall, or we call GAR, and forecasting. It has a high resolution gridded uh, hydro hydrologic and hydraulic model. It predicts the heights and the lead time for potential flooding. So it's it's going to take this information and it's it predicts the the height of the flood that's coming and the timing. That it's going. I'll hopefully be able to show you here soon the graphs uh, of that. And it has obviously visualization tools of that flood information. Now, this pilot project that we're in with our consultant, View and Associates, uh, it started back in FY20, so back in 2019. And phase one just focused on Crabtree, tr Crabtree Creek. I say just Crabtree, but you know, oh, we all have more problems with Crabtree than, than anyone. So that's why we wanted to focus on it uh, to begin with. Phase two, which Jesse has, wrapped, has just wrapped up, uh, we expanded that to Walnut Creek and the other city watersheds. So, and we have also implemented an inundation mapping into this software, uh, a rules manager, and alerts. So now we can go in and uh, create scenarios, and I'll show you this in a little while. Uh, and so let's say, for instance, I want to know on a certain grid or watershed if it rains two inches in an hour. Uh, you can put that parameter there and it and if it meets that threshold, it will send you send you that from that uh, alert and let you know that it has. It also is hooked up to the forecasting as well. So if the forecast you can say I want to know if it's forecasted the rain two inches in this watershed, you know, within an hour uh, or two hours, whatever. And it will send you alert to say, hey, it's forecasted to do this. So it's, it's a pretty, pretty neat uh, software and technology. So the gauge adjusted radar rainfall. Uh, what, so what does this do? Uh, it combines weather radar, current weather radar as it's showing, and local rain gauges in real time at five minute intervals. So every five minutes, the system is looking at the current radar and looking at the gauges and it's determining how much is raining uh, in areas. So, as you know, probably in looking at many rainfalls, you, radars, you can go and look and see, it says the radar has estimated it's raining two inches in this, in this location. Well, that's true, it could be, but it's just an estimate what the radar is seeing at the intensity that the rain is raining. But you need those uh, rain gauges, and that's why we want to build out the rain gauge network as much as we can those rain gauges validate and correct the radar's estimates. And the radar is great because it fills in the gap, so to speak, between the, um, the rain gauges, but you really need those rain gauges to, uh, to do the quality control on the radar and get it honed in right, which you can also do the opposite. You can do the quality control, as, as we've seen here, on the rain gauges with the radar. You can check and see if they're, they're you know, the same with the bias correction. If you can see this graph right here, um, the yellow one is the the, uh, the guard, the gauge adjusted radar rainfall, and the blue one is actually the gauge. And you see they're they're coming along pretty good. There is a little little bit of difference right there, which that that little bit is fine. That, that, that's no problem. But once in a while, you might see, let's say the um, the gauge. The blue line, it might start 
weight going off like this to the side and getting a big separation. Then you know that that gauge is probably clogged with something. Maybe, I don't know, maybe some trash got in it. Maybe a spider went and built a spider web. That happens a lot. And, but you can see that on, on, the, on the graph and know that there's something wrong with that gauge. And then at that point can contact USGS to go out there and take a look at it and, and, and see what's going on with that gauge. So the gauge adjusted radar rainfall is a, is a great tool to have. Also, we got a uh, gridded forecast rainfall. Um, this uh, shows the current rain, rainfall and forecasted rainfall. So um, current radar rainfall intensity. So you can hover over uh, these areas and it'll tell you how much it's raining. It might say, well, it's raining one, one inch an hour. Or it might say, it's you know, raining two inches an hour or something like that. You can hover over it. Uh, it also do an accumulation factor over an hour. So you can put, play it forward, so to speak, and then it, uh, it shows that accumulation amount. You can hover over that and then show you how much it's predicted to rain in the next hour in a certain location. And these are new uh, this year. We have added the 18 hour HER model to the forecast. So we can see how much it's gonna forecast the rain over Raleigh or certain areas or watersheds in Raleigh over the next eight, 18 hours or and we've also added the three day uh, NDFD model uh, to see that as well. So uh, coming in the future, hopefully this year, uh, in the next phase, we'll be adding a 10 to 14 day uh, forecast as well. So that these 10 to 14 day and three day, uh, they're gonna help out a lot uh, when it comes to hurricane season and predicting of what you know hurricanes and rainfall might happen over, over the city over the next several days. So, uh, model based gauge height and lead time prediction. So this is what, what a lot of people wants to, wants to see. So um, I'll, I'll show you a closer up version later on, but if you'll see the red lines, that's the current or observa observa observed uh, levels of the uh, stream. The blue line is the predicted uh, of what they think, this, what the system thinks the stream is gonna do, right? So it, this, and we call it VFLOW, uh, but what it does and how they get this prediction is, is input from the guard that we were, we were looking at, the gauge adjusted radar rainfall, and the, the current time, and the forecasted rainfall, how much you think it's going to rain over that area, right, or over that watershed that's coming down to this certain point of the gauge. Looks at the drainage network and the hydraulics to determine the hydro, hydrologic response. Grid-based uh, GIS data uh, setup, soils, what type soils are in that area, uh, the land use that's in that area, is it residential, is it commercial, is there, you know, would there be obviously maybe more runoff in a commercial area than there would be in a residential, yeah. So it looks at those things. Uh, the kinematic wave and for overland channels and sales, uh, channel hydraulics including cross sections, rating curves, trapezoid channels and others, uh, soil saturation, and runoff and infiltration rate uh, excess and subsurface runoff. I can, I can say in working with the consultant over the last couple of years, uh, that has been one of the big and key factors, uh, getting the subsurface runoff correct. Because if you start high, uh, if, you, if your subsurface runoff uh, is, is not equal with what you're observed right now and you start high, your prediction is probably gonna be high, right? Or if you start low, your prediction is gonna be low. So. We're trying to get everything to match up uh, with, with what is current before the, the uh, rain falls, rain starts. And continuous soil moisture uh, updating in real time and also adding reservoir route in the system. So all these things are coming together in the software to, to do this prediction. So there's a, lo a lot of work behind the scenes uh, that's going on. And something new that's been added this year is predictive inundation uh, flooding and showing that and also uh, alerts uh, that I had spoke about early, earlier. So this predictive inundation from our uh, leaf flow results uh, to produce real time and, and based on current estimates of the GAR. So all this information that we were just talking about on the last slide is going into the predictions of the, the heights of the gauges, the lead time, and also this inundation. And so we got the high resolution with individual hydrographs produced for each grid cell. 
And in there, there are one by one kilometer grid cells, and it, it's each one of them is, is predicted. Uh, rules can be uh, uh, can, uh, configured for these alerts. So if you want uh, to know about if you get in, maybe you say, I want to know if this area gets five feet of inundation, you want to be notified in a SIN path or anything on hydrographs or rainfalls or depth, duration, and frequencies. You can get them by emails, phone calls. Uh, text messages, messages, and this keeps all this everything in the system for uh, institutional knowledge. And this is very important, not only for us, but for our emergency managers. And as we build this system out, uh, this is really what we want to do. We want to, we don't want to keep it ourselves. We want to share it with our emergency managers and others uh, to, um, you know, so they, so they can. As first responders, be on site when when needed, and get informed of, of things that are coming up. Kelly, can I interrupt with a question? Yeah. Oh, I'm not interrupting. Here you are. <laughs> you, can, you can ask anytime you want to. <laughs> <laughs> now looks like a good time. <laughs> on the uh, the V flow prediction model, what what period of record is the the underlying model based on in terms of rainfall and gauge observations? Right, uh, that's a great question, and I I don't know exactly that, but I'll write that down and get back to you with it, if that's okay. Yeah, that, this is all really exciting stuff, and I'm I'm thinking about you know the predictions about changing precipitation patterns from uh, climate change. You know, um, it's fantastic that the city is investing in these uh, stream gauges and rainfall gauges because without you know data collection we can't update the period of record and therefore the models that our predictions are uh, based on so um and we don't want to be making decisions now that are based on a different precipitation regime i guess that's probably pretty obvious to most folks here in this room but thanks M mr chair if i could make a comment on that so too and just for clarification um the, the model has been based on um, the, the historical uh, calibration to historical events where they calibrated the runoff that came from actual storm events. And that, and that calibration continues as we get more events. Um, but just to clarify, this prediction is based on the actual predicted rainfall for any specific event that's, uh, you know, as it's occurring. So it's it's looking into the future several hours based on the the, the view predicted rainfall um, and and plugging that into the model in real time and making those project projections and predictions in real time moving forward. So that that's that's the power of this model. It's not tied to any specific quote design storm. It's it's based on real uh, real rainfall that was predicted to occur. Um, in the near term future, um, as as we progress, and those can and those predictions continue to update as new information is available. Thanks. Thank, thanks, Wayne. Yeah, yeah Evan, I, I can say that as far as a period of record, I, like I say, I, I'll check. I don't think there's any specific period of record. I know we took specific storms like uh, Hurricane Matthew, uh, Florence. Uh, some of the spring storms that, that have done, you know, had quite a bit of flooding with them. I think it was the April 2017 storm. It was, I think it was like five or six storms uh, that they ran through the model and calibrated to try to meet those USGS gauge heights, right? Mm -hmm. And and um, so so that's what they use. And Wayne is absolutely 100% correct. It, it's, it's taking everything that's currently happening right now looking at the the rain gauges how, how much rain has fall fallen how much uh is predicting to fall what the radar looks like is more rain moving over the area currently or is or is less right or is it about to end um it's looking at the gauge heights of um, across the stream gauges across raleigh and predicting what is what is to come so it's, it's real time ongoing and that's uh, one of the reasons we're kind of excited about getting the uh, alert two system with that five minute reporting. So the more information we can get and the faster we can get it, the better predictions that, that we can have. Uh, 
and get information out sooner. Thanks for all that explanation. Anyone else has a question right now? If not, I'm going to go to the software. You might have some questions. Anybody else? Hey, Kelly, where's the uh, predicted or the forecast of rainfall coming from? I may have missed that. I'll show it to you. How about that? Will that be all right? And you see this screen right here? It looks like a map. Yeah. Okay. So this is the system itself, and and right, and it's it's um. Let me let me hit refresh on this thing. I've had it up a while. So, so when you come into the to the system, and I'll get to your question here in, in a minute, Mark. Uh, okay. but when you when you come in, come to the system, you just have your regular map here that may look like something like IMAPs. If if many of y'all have used IMAPs, it has a a threshold here or a, a label of showing the potential rainfall amounts, and it grows over time. Uh, not sure if you can see or not, but it has all our gauges on here. There's a rain gauges in, in these locations. It says zero, so it's not, it's not raining. We have our uh, stream gauge locations as well, and it shows the level, what the levels are at those locations. If you click on them, it'll, it'll pop up, and you can go to that, uh, that location and see what the level is and what the blue line is, the predicted red is the observed, and see what it's predicted or, or potentially may be. Same thing with the, the rainfall you can see. But that's just the base map. Looks like it's not been raining out there. So um, that's that's what you get, right? But you had asked uh, Mark about the um, about the forecast. So what it does it looks at um, it's called a preview of what the forecast is over the next hour. Um, some rain over here near Jacksonville and place. I don't see any really rain around our area, but spotty stuff. Uh, but what it does, it looks over the radar that's current, and then it takes over the next hour what the rain, I don't know if you can see it or not, but you can see the rain moving potentially its path over the next hour. That's, that's what it's doing. And it's going to calculate how much of that rainfall is going to come over and what the accumulation is going to be along with the current radar that it's showing, along with the rain gauge totals and the gauge height. So this is where the the rate, the current, so to speak, radar is coming from this uh, preview of the uh, the Raleigh uh, radar. You so the, the yeah. program itself is making that prediction as to yeah. how much rain to expect. It's not like you're pulling it from NOAA or somebody else that you know makes those predictions. It's the model itself is able to do that. That's exactly right. It's it's not it's not so it's not relying on a forecast that was done 24 hours ago or 12 hours ago or six hours ago that it's supposed to rain, you know, one inch, two inches, whatever. You know as well as I do, that's just a forecast, and and you know you could be predicted to get uh, a tenth of an inch, and it might rain two inches. So. Uh, what it's doing is getting real time information and um, and providing that and putting that into the system to make the, the prediction. So if you hope like this is the radar, if you hover over it, like I was saying er earlier, it tells you how much it's raining. So you're seeing about a quarter, three quarters of an inch an hour in that storm right there. Uh, you, we do have the ability to do an accumulation of what it could be over the next hour. And this is really what the system does behind the scenes and you can just do it manually. Um, you can drag it out over the next hour, and it's showing like in this area right here, like six tenths of an inch an hour. Uh, these areas are like two hundredths of an hour in, a, in the next hour. So that, that's what the system's kind of doing behind the scene to get that information to plug it into uh, the system and make the prediction. So that's where the forecasting is going to happen. Gotcha. And, and we have the ability to do this, not with just an hour, but it's got the, the HER model that does 18 hours, does the same thing, and the NDFD, which does three days. 
uh, than it does to some as well. It shows you what it is and the accumulation. The okay. one thing I wanted, is that good? Is that what you? Yeah, that answers my question. Okay, all right. So uh, one thing that um, I thought you might be interested in, if I can pull it up. Yep, this looks like it. I wanted to pull up, uh, if y'all remember back in July, uh, we had Tropical Storm Elsa that came through. And since it's not raining today, you know how it is, these, the weather doesn't cooperate when you're doing a presentation and, and you're trying to show people how the, how the system works. So I pulled up the, uh, you, what's a great thing about the system, uh, not only you can see it in real time, you can go back into history and pull up data from past days, storm events, and that's what I've done here. Pulled up Tropical Storm Elsa. So as you can see, uh, with Tropical Storm Elsa, uh, the green being the lower rainfall amounts, the red being the higher rainfall amounts. Uh, you, we had a lot more rain on the east side of Raleigh than we did on the west side. So the west side of Raleigh got around two inches, two or so, two and a quarter, uh, through this yellow area. Uh, it's about three inches, two and a half, three inches or something like here. And the red area is anywhere from four to five inches of rainfall. And this is something that's great about the GAR, the gauge adjusted radar rainfall. See, if, in these areas, you'll see there's, there's a rain gauge down here and a rain gauge here, which recorded 3.84 or 3.9. But in these areas, it was four to five inches of rain, which then there's no rain gauges here. So without this uh, gauge adjusted radar rainfall, we wouldn't be able to know that it rained uh, these amounts on this side of town. So that, that's a great tool that we have here to, to see. Uh, also, it has, I've uploaded the DDF uh, information on here from a, it's got from a two year to a thousand year event. And if you hover over these cells, uh, if you look at, at the, uh, the top, the time the cell number is that 1755, but the first one after that, you'll see a less than a two year. So it's a less than a two year event in this area. If you hover over the yellow areas, they were pretty much all two year events. And when you come over in these areas, you got 10, 10 year events. And if you come down here, you got a few 25s and 50 year events in, in these areas. So that's some great information to know especially when we got our maybe sediment erosion control inspectors who are doing uh, site inspections and in which may be the, the SEMs may not be designed for certain year events or, or you know, that kind of things. Uh, it's great to know in those situations so if it held up to what it was supposed to or not. So that's a DD. Any, any questions on, on this? Man, that's good. That's a great graphic, Kelly. I'm thinking other uses for it. I hadn't thought about the erosion control, but I know presenting the city council, I don't know how many times we've had to tell them, well, yeah, we had a, a 10 year event. And they said, well, that's the, that's the fifth 10 year event we had this year. <laughs> and it's because it's like this, they had a 10 year event over there by Nightdale, but the rest of Raleigh didn't have that. But then, you know, two months from now, the west side of Raleigh may have that two year event. And so you can show them that, you know, these events, or, you know, the, the kinds of storms we have, it's not the whole city getting a 10 year event, it's areas. And that's why we seem to have more frequent 10 year events than what we expect. Great. That's, a, that's a great point. Um, and Wayne can try, chime in if he would like, but yeah, he's, he's emailed me uh, several times over the last year or so. And when we've had, you know, certain storm events or maybe it rained in a certain spot, you know, how it uh, might be a thunderstorm will pop over a certain spot and it's, it didn't happen anywhere else, but they had just a downpour and pull up information and see how much rain we had there and, and information from the system and provide him for, I'm sure, questions from, from upper management and council about about those rain events. I don't know if Wayne wants to speak speak to that or not. Yeah, yeah thanks, Kelly. And and I'll just agree and reinforce the, the, the value of this is immeasurable. We're, we're coming up with new applications all the time for how we can use this data. Um, you know, in our watershed studies, it's helpful for um, calibrating our, our hydraulic and the hydrologic models based on, on real data and real storms and observations. Um, Kelly mentioned we, we've had quite a few times that we've pulled up um, where erosion control um, measures failed, as he said, and our inspectors have been out there and 
Um, you know, we want to see if they've designed their um, controls properly to, to meet the 10 year storm event and then see if in some situations, you know, we might have had one small area did exceed that 10 year storm event. Um, and, and so, you know, they exceeded the design of those controls, but in a lot of cases that they, they said it did, but it wasn't. We, we have a basis for enforcement in those situations now. So quite a few applications um, that this data is really helping us um, address. And, and, and it's very, very value, valuable, not only for the flood early warning system, as Kelly's very well described, but lots of other um, aspects of our program as well. And speaking to Evan's comments earlier about, you know, what's the, the how long has this data been accumulated that we're working off of? I mean, you, you think about the numbers we're using for predicting storms, they're based on a history of gauges. We might have had one gauge in Raleigh or one out at the airport, and it completely missed that 25 year storm to the east of Raleigh. Well, with the, the density of rain gauges we have now, we're picking up those storms. So I have a feeling that. The predictive models are going to show we're getting a lot more um, intense storms that are just have been missed in the past, and the, the numbers are going to get cranked up a little bit for our rainfall frequency numbers. That's a great point, Mark. That's a great point. And uh, another thing, these are you know USGS gauges, so they're they're being captured, you know, by by the government, so to speak, and and going into the the national database uh, for that. I just wanted to add, uh, it'd be interesting to see if you can map those, the microclimates and he see how that correlates to veget vegetation or impervious surfaces. Um, it's neat, it's very neat. Thank you for that. Yeah, that, that's a very good point too, Katie. In fact, um, you, you know, we anecdotally, we, we haven't done the formal analysis, but anecdotally, it does seem common where we will see um, events moving into Raleigh, and as soon as they hit the highly impervious downtown areas, the rainfall intensity tends to pick up a little bit, and you, you see the impacts of that heat island effect in those microclimates much more clearly when you, when you can see it like this graphically. Yeah, well, Matt, well, Wayne, that's a little bit of a good segue into what I was next. I was going to show. Them. Um, so, uh, I don't know if people remember or not back, uh, in September on September the 9th, um, nobody was thinking we was going to get much of a rain rainfall event. And, um, we had a little front area moving in into Raleigh around lunchtime and didn't have much rain with it. But when it got to Raleigh, it kind of exploded over Raleigh and especially in, uh, northeastern parts, north central and northeastern part of Raleigh. And, um, and what I've done here is with the gauge adjusted radar uh, rainfall uh, map, you can pull it up in different different aspects. The one I had on previously was the grid, the one kilometer grids. And now I've pulled it up by watershed. So you can actually pull it up and it does a um, an average over that watershed. Let's say that we're gonna look at, uh, let's say Marsh Creek uh, during that rain event, it got a 1.8 uh, two inches on average over that whole watershed. So you can average it out over the whole watershed with, with this uh, gauge adjusted radar rainfall, which is pretty neat because a lot of times people want to know how what happened in that watershed because draining it to a specific point. Um, and one another thing that happened on that with during that rain event is we did have uh, some street flooding and and also we have one of the creeks uh, get out of bank out of bank we noticed that uh, i think i have to give wayne props on that one i think he, he saw the, the the marsh creek gauge uh getting up pretty high and uh actually went out there and looked at it and uh the little the bruton place out there i'll, I'll zoom down in into it. it goes in here uh, right off of capitol boulevard i know many people know about the the u-haul that you that sits right here so it's kind of across the street. If you go up Capitol above the belt line and right where old Trawick Road is, I think there's a Burger King McDonald's sets right here. Uh, but Bruton Place, uh, it's a commercial, older commercial uh, subdivision, so to speak. Uh, but they did have flooding along the street here. And this is a good example of our inundation mapping that we had. And that's one another reason I want to pull this up. As you can see in this blue area, 
it shows the inundation coming out onto the street. And that's really what happened. Uh, the creek comes and does a bend uh, here and it jumped out of, of the banks and come across uh, through here and went down into the street area. And because the creek was high enough, it, it couldn't outlet and, and it uh, ponded up in this in this creek. So this is another example of the, the good work that our consultants are doing, uh, providing this inundation uh, mapping tool. Uh, and this one, obviously it's gonna have to be, be tweaked, uh, some tweaks that need to be made, but this, this prediction right here was pretty much spot on, uh, which is great. So any, any questions about this map feature? Before I move on. All right, if not, I'm going to go to uh, a few more and then we'll, we'll wrap this thing up. Uh, we do these will be quick. We do have our, our rain gauges. So all the rain gauges in in the area around Lake County, Durham, uh, things that may affect us with fronts coming through into our area. Uh, we have the rain gauges, uh, one hour, six hour, 24, 48, 72. Currently, we do have the ability to, this is in real time, but we do have the ability to go back in the past and pull up date and time and see what it was at, at those times. Uh, watch points, this, this is our gauge, uh, our gauge predictions and, and things like that. Uh, there we go, it's getting worried there, I'm coming up. I think it's getting close to the end of the day and I think it's kind of tired. Uh, but as you can see, the, the red line, as I was telling about earlier, is the current uh, or observed uh, elevation. The blue line is to predict it. Unfortunately, yes, it's not cooperating right because it's not raining outside. But I'm going to hopefully, hopefully you go back in the past and pull something for you up real quick. And show this, show this for you. Say, I want to say 6, what else good? 6.41 p.m. So this is what it looked like during towards the end of Tropical Storm Elsa. Uh, you can see the red line was what happened actually occurred, and the blue line was what was predicted. Now you're going to see some of them are a little bit off, but I will have to say when you're doing a prediction on what the flood height is going to be for creeks and what the timing of that flood height was going to be, I think the model is doing pretty pretty excellent. I mean, some of these are, are pretty spot on, and we have been extremely pleased uh, with these. Uh, I'll pull, I'll be, I'll be, oh, I, I guess you can say I'm pulling up one of the better ones. I don't know. But I'm going to pull up one of these and try to get it a little bit bigger so you can see it better, if that's okay. All right. Hope you can see that better. So you can see on the red of all the observed reports, as it's going up and down, and this blue line was the predictive out in the future. Uh, it won't happen in at the same time. This was actually predicted out in the future before the red got there, so to speak, and it followed pretty close on the same path uh, as of what was predicted. So we're we're really uh, pleased with this. Um, for the most part, most time the prediction seems to be just a little bit higher than the actual, which which is is pretty good. We would rather we'd really like to have it spot on, but with a predict, we don't want to under predict, and we'd rather have it over predict. So, um, before I jump off of this, any questions? Any questions on this? That's fantastic. That's pretty amazing. What What's the name of the software, Kelly? Yeah, this is the this is uh, View and Associates. Uh, it's called the VIP, and it's what what it's called. It's just their flood early warning software. And um, the other thing is, I wanted to show you lastly, is our rules manager that can send alerts. Uh, to the left side, uh, you can receive alerts on every one of these things, depth duration frequencies, forecasts. So if you say, I wanna know when um, a certain grid or watershed uh, reaches a 10 year storm event, uh, maybe if I'm a sediment erosion control, I'm going to pick on sediment erosion control, I guess, because I used to be one. So if I'm a sediment erosion control inspector and I want to know any time my site uh, has a 10-year storm event, I can request this 
and get alerted to let me know that that site got a, a 10 year storm event. And so I could check it or, you know, or whatever it needed to be. Um, forecast, you can get um, notifications if something's forecasted to get two inches of rainfall or, or whatever. If the gauge adjusted radar rainfall has saying it has done two inches, let's say in a certain time, rain gauge amounts, if they reach a certain inundation levels, uh, preview, which is the rainfall predictions, and the watch points is the, the gauges, actual stream gauges. You can get reports on those if you want to set, I want it at a certain height or if it's gone up at a certain rate uh, over a certain time. Uh, so I know we're getting close, close to time. So uh, I'm going to stop there. If anybody else has, anybody's got any more questions, I'll be, be glad to answer them for you. Just to if I could just make some kind of closing comments just um, as to the, the power of this and, and the real benefits we see to the community in being able to predict flooding, especially significant flooding, even, even if it only gives us one or two hours advance notice, as may be the, the case, in some, especially in some, you know, unexpected summer thunderstorm types of, of events. That still gives us warning time to mobilize first responders or transportation crews to be ready for, for barricades. Um, you know, an, another example of the alerts Kelly set up, if we, if we have some, some dams that we know if that watershed gets six inches of rainfall, that, that dam, you know, could be vulnerable um, to, uh, to overtopping. That gives us advanced warning to, start invoking potential safety measures that might be needed and notification measures that might be needed um, to, to, to warn residents in vulnerable areas that, that flooding could be occurring. So um, it, it really gives us a, a lot um, more information and can be very powerful to um, help improve our responsiveness to our community and, and get people safe before significant floodings are pr predicted to occur. So we're, we're very, very excited about this tool and. Um, you know, it, it's going to continue to improve as um, as we use it more and as we get more specific events and are able to compare its predictions to actual um, actual events. So um, great, great tool. And Kelly, thanks very much for a real nice demo and overview of the of the package. Ten four. Hope, hope everyone uh, enjoyed it and, and, and learned something uh, about what we're doing and, and hopefully all approve. Uh, of it and and looking for learn, looking for even better things in the future. I'll be glad to come back and give y'all an update anytime. I'm I'm finally in, in the position. Uh, I'm still helping out a little bit with uh, Matthew Hunt, who's new with the business services a little bit, but I'm kindly in the in the position now full time and getting ready to to put the hammer down, so to speak, and 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 go with it. So I'll invite any other commission members to. Comment or ask ask questions if they have any. The only other thing I can offer is um, make sure you promote that and tell everybody how the stormwater utility fees paying for that great stuff because that's some pretty pretty cool stuff you guys have put together and you need to get some mileage out of it. That's true. That's true. Yeah, we're we're trying to pr promote it, Mark. I, um, uh, we've been doing some quite a few presentations for folks and, and different groups and. Uh, we actually did a presentation on what we we're doing uh, to the Texas floodplain managers conference uh, back a few months ago. So we're, we're spreading the word and we're getting a lot of good and positive feedback about what we're doing. And our, uh, our consultants are saying that we're actually uh, leading the state and leading uh, the nation in some aspects of it. So uh, we're really excited about it. I'll add, I've been uh, sitting in on a webinar series from NOAA called Our Changing Precipitation. I imagine some other people in this room have been sitting in on those as well. Um, and there's been a lot of conversation in there about uh, NOAA's prediction tools and uh, the situation of municipalities who need to deal with stormwater runoff and, and better predictions. Um, and from my perspective, you know, in sitting in those webinars, uh, 
just looks like Raleigh is really um, getting out and being proactive and sort of leading the pack uh, in that regard. So glad to see it. And and yeah, we should promote that and talk to people about this is this is what you get for your money. Absolutely appreciate the comments. And again, back back to the commission. Thank you for um, supporting and recommending the the levels of service that allow this important work to to continue. Um, that that's what makes it happen, and that's what helped fund Kelly's position where he can really focus on taking this to the next level and continue the work with his consultant to to improve this tool. I I really believe it's a important safety aspect to to help our community stay safer. And and how does it feel to get your full time, Kelly? Hey, it's it's great. I, I I'm loving it. This this as it's kind of I told Wayne and and Scott uh, when I was a kid. I used to be one of those. I don't know if y'all did it or not. You remember those uh, hurricane tractor tractor poster things you used to print out or get at uh, Fast Fair or wherever it was, and then you put them on. You stick them on your refrigerator, and you couldn't wait to the. Uh, I couldn't wait to they did the weather to give you the coordinates so you could plot the hurricane on the map. You know, I know I'm crazy. I'm sorry, but I, I said I never thought I'd be able to actually do that. You know, be I have a job that had the ability to be in that, and so so I'm I'm loving it. So it's it's great. I'm excited about it. Well, we're glad we had a, a chance to to give you more than five minutes today. That's the end of our official agenda. Uh, do we have any other uh, comments in the chat? I haven't seen any. No, sir. I'm not seeing any additional chat questions or, or, or comments. Any other business that other commissioners want to bring up at this time? Um, before we adjourn, um, I guess coming up in November, I think we're going to hear an update about uh, considerations of equity in stormwater program. Is that correct, Wayne? Yes, yes, it is. Um, and we anticipate that that's probably going to be a two part series. We'll, we'll start that in November and, um, and continue on in December that so y'all have a, a little bit of an opportunity to digest some of the early information and give us some additional feedback in, in December. But yes, we're very much looking forward to having that conversation with, with you all. I'm excited about some of the, the, the work that we have to present from our consultant. That's great. Uh, I think that's a really important uh, policy question that we'll be bringing up and considering. Uh, it's complicated and um, I think it's you know, due for a strong consideration. Um, I'll just take a moment just as I guess a point of privilege here, and, and I hope I'm not uh, condescending to any commission member, I certainly will be uh, projecting based on my own past uh, <laughs> behavior on this commission, but um, in recognizing the limitations of the, the media that we have to work in here with virtual meetings and the fact that today's agenda was uh, fairly routine matters, I just want to encourage the commission members to you know, vigorously review the agenda packet and vigorously engage with the staff uh, during these meetings, whether your questions come from a position of skepticism or advocacy or uh, ignorance. Um, that's where you know the the learning curve really um, comes in. There, there are no stupid questions you can ask here. I think there's a number of people um, here on the commission with a lot of experience and a lot of background. Uh, and some with less, and I think um, if you're, you know, coming coming to this with less experience, uh, please ask those questions as an opportunity to learn from uh, the staff and commission members with with more experience. Um, we're here to represent the residents of the city and our neighbors in how their environment and how their tax dollars and their fees are prioritized, invested, and used. Um, and we're on a really good trajectory right now with the stormwater program, um, but we, we got here through vigorous engagement and we stay here 
on this good trajectory through vigorous engagement. So um, look forward to uh, a good discussion next month and, uh, and continuing. If there are any other commissioner comments, we can take them now. Otherwise, we can take a motion to adjourn. Move adjourn. Second. Thank you. All in favor? All right. That's unanimous. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Wayne, and all the staff who presented. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate your time today.